sharing my screen. And then we'll hear from Ezekiel um, Kasanga about how they're using mapping for their um, at their open street at their open school in um, Tabora. And then we're going to hear from Laura about more general um, gender aspects of mapping. Please do um, ask any questions in the chat um, and we'll try and answer them. Um, any questions about the presentations or also around um, mapping more generally. So happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, I'm the chair of Tanzania Development Trust. We've been working with communities for the last 46 years in rural Tanzania. Um, our priorities are clean water, girls' education and income generating projects. And because those are in very rural areas that are poorly mapped, we started um, Crowd to Map six years ago now. Because much of rural Tanzania, um, it looks it's very poorly mapped on Google Maps. Um, there's very little often. Um, and even in OpenStreetMap in rural areas, a lot of things were missing. So there's been huge amounts of mapping in places like Dar es Salaam around protecting people from flooding in particular. But in rural Tanzania, um, certainly when we started, there was uh, still a lot of gaps and there still are. So in this map here, 10,000 people might live. So we've been making maps um, for the last six years. We have over 17,000 online volunteers from all around the world and great to see some of them here today. And we've added, I think, over 7 million buildings now um, into OpenStreetMap in rural Tanzania. So that's adding information from satellite images that many of you have already done this, so you're well aware. So looking to see where the buildings are, as in here, tracing them and adding them and roads, etc. And this is what the satellite images might look like compared to the situation on the ground. So generally how we do this is we set up tasks on the tasking manager. So this takes an area that we want to map and it divides it into a small squares. And then what each mapper can map one square um, at one time to stop any um, conflicts and uh, confusion. And also it's a two stage process. One person can map it and then another more experienced person can then validate it to say yes all the buildings and roads or whatever that were asked for are complete on that square but also some of us are also mapping directly into open street map right so if you have a particular area of interest um, that you know very well then you can you can add things directly into open street map so, for example, village names, etc. And then we're also taking open government data, such as locations of clinics or um, schools um, from government data. We're just posting the lat long coordinates into OpenStreetMap and then comparing that with the satellite image. And if we can see there's something that looks like a clinic or a school there that we've been adding to it, adding it. So as I mentioned, the Slack channel, if you haven't joined, please, please do so if you're interested. It's really great to get feedback and ask questions, as you can see here. And we've also set up some badges for mappers, right, so that you can test your skills about adding buildings and also um, rows. And we're hoping to develop these further. And if anyone's interested in helping with that, please let me know. Um, we've also been doing a lot of training. Um, I think Harry's jo joined now, so big shout out to him. He's do been doing some fantastic um, training sessions via Zoom, many in Swahili, and um, they're all on our YouTube channel, and I'll put the link in the chat. So, but the, the main thing that we've been doing is really training people on the ground in rural Tanzania to add their local knowledge to OpenStreetMap. So, for example, here behind you, there, here is a water point. So these people are 
using um, their phone to add that into the map. Previously, we were using maps.me, mm -hmm. but now we've moved on to um, organic maps, which is very similar, but works a bit better. And I'll also post some instructions for that if people are interested. So using um, mobile apps also allows routing. Um, so it allows you to decide exactly how you're going to get to wherever you need to do to get to. And we've worked with FGM activists and the police to use maps.me and now organic maps to get quickly to the places that they need to get to. Because in Tanzania, um, there is still high incidences of female genital mutilation, FGM, particularly in the areas shown. And usually this happens in cutting seasons. Um, particularly in the school holidays. So we're expecting one to happen during the Easter holidays next month. So we've been working with um, local partner Hope for Girls and Women, who um, are FGM um, survivors and activists um, campaigning, doing outreach work in the villages, um, telling girls and their parents that this is illegal and that girls um, have a choice not to be subjected to this very dangerous practice. And they also run safe houses for girls refusing FGM. Now, to help with this work, they've recruited um, a whole network of dig digital champions. So this is a woman in each village that is responsible for helping um, map the village but also to re report cases of gender-based violence using a free app called ODK or Kobo. And here you can see some um, people being trained and also um, people seeing maps of their village for the first time. Uh, Janet, can you hear me? Yeah. You're sharing your slides. Am I, yes, I are you not seeing them? And someone in the chat said as well that they couldn't see it. I thought it was just... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Well, that's great then. Um, <laughs> right, okay. I'll try again. Um, can you see Can you see my slide now? Yeah. yeah. Can you see it now? I can see it. Yeah. Oh gosh, right, okay. I'm gonna just go very quickly then. So happy, right, okay. So, all right. Um, all right, so I was talking about Tanzania Development Trust. Um, hope you can still see. Um, I think we've gone through all this. I'll put the slides in the chat anyway. Um, all right, so can you still see this? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> all right, so um, one of the other things that we've done is produce a lot of maps of um, different areas. So uh, maps of villages, and here you can see um, a clan map. So clans are sub tribes, and this is particularly important when fighting FGM because different clans um, cut girls at different times. So having a map of where the different clans are located is really um, important for fighting against FGM. One of our priorities is um, girls' access to education, and Ezekiel is going to be talking about this um, very shortly. So we are also um, funding girls' hostels. So Ekondo School is where we've funded a hostel, and in order to um, justify just how important the hostel was, they created this map showing how far students are walking. There's no public transport in this area, so students are walking uh, up to nine kilometers each way um, to and from school. So it's great to see so many youth mappers um, here, and 
we've helped set up, I think there's 16 different youth mapper chapters in Tanzania now. Um, so it's really great to work with them. Um, and if you want to know more about youth mappers, then there's many different people here who can uh, say more about it in a moment. We're also really um, keen to be part of the Everywhere She Maps initiative, um, which is a youth mapper initiative that perhaps um, Laura can mention a bit more about in a moment. And this is really trying to get more women into um, open into the GIS community. So we were delighted that this year we had um, nine interns. Um, all women um, who came through this program, and I think some of them are hopefully here today. So I mentioned the Digital Champions. Um, this is an ongoing project to uh, improve the map in Serengeti because better maps with um, Roby and her um, activists have um, estimated that they've helped over 3,000 girls find the safe houses and avoid being cut. So really better maps is protecting lives. So if you're interested in getting um, involved with crowd to map going forwards, we're always looking for new volunteers. Here are some of the things that you could help with. Um, so thank you very much and apologies for the technical mishap. And if you'd like to know more, then there's more on our website and please also do get in touch. So before we go on, um, are there any um, questions or comments? Um, uh, I'm hoping that pe people did at least see the end of that. And as I said, we're mapping at this um, We're mapping here if people want to get mapping. Um, Laura, um, can, can you go next? Uh, Thank you, Courtney. Um, I think I need to make you a co-host. And if people um, have any questions, please ask them in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself and ask, please do so. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, first of all, I think <laughs> happy, happy International, International Women's Day to uh, all the women attending the call. Uh, I hope you've had uh, a great and amazing day. Yeah, and I was introduced. My name is Laura Mugeha. I am an Everashi Maps Regional Ambassador with Youth Mappers. Um, I'll share a bit on that. So actually for today, uh, I wanted to talk a bit on gender data and how, how it's important and what we can do about it when it comes to open mapping. Uh, but to start off, uh, I can talk a bit about Youth Mappers for those who are not familiar. So the Youth Mappers Network is uh, it's actually a network of uh, university chapters. Uh, and these are chapters of students who are interested in open mapping and actually using it to uh, either contribute to already existing initiatives uh, that solve problems that people face uh, on a day on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but also um, it's these clubs coming in together and using open mapping and creating their own projects uh, that work on different topics uh, in society. At the moment, we have around 300 chapters, over 300 chapters across the world. We just celebrated that a week ago, and the majority of those chapters are within the African continent. And even as Janet was sharing, in Tanzania, we have around 16 amazing youth mappers chapters. Uh, under that we have the Every Rushy Maps Initiative, whose aim is to empower female student members, highlight their stories, uh, and also uh, get 
get more female members participating in not just the youth map as metric, but the larger open mapping community. Uh, for those who have been in the open sport community, we know uh, the, the space is not as equal uh, as we would want it to be for a long time. I think we've only had one board member who's female. Uh, and th that actually ends up affecting uh, a number of things. And it's not just the board membership, but also things like working groups and how things are formulated and uh, and decision and how decisions are also being made. So yeah, the whole goal is just to empower uh, female student members uh, who are part of the Youth Mapers Network for them to thrive within the open mapping community in general. And under that, there are a number of activities, uh, including uh, an internship program. And I, I believe Courtney has shared some information on the chat section. And part of that, there was there are a number of uh, uh, student members who are able to be interns uh, uh, with the Crowd to Map organization for a number of projects last year. Uh, other than that, we also have uh, a focus on uh, creating technical content uh, on training uh, on different topics. So in addition to open mapping, also on things like soft skills, uh, things like communications. Last year, we had a whole series that focused on professional development. So how to do your CV, um, how to do your cover letter, how to apply for jobs and all that. And all those are recorded and are available as a, uh, on uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search Mapas, you'll be able to access those recordings. Uh, then there are also a number of activities that are yet to be implemented, but I would, I would advise to go to the Youth Mapas website uh, and uh, under projects, you'll be able to find a page for Adria Shima uh, where you can get more information. Uh, but also if you have any questions, I believe you can either post on chat or also reach out to uh, either of the area she wants to develop regional amb ambassadors and also Courtney Clark, our director, who's also on call. <laughs> yeah, so getting right into it. So, data, gender, and maps, how do those intersect? Uh, I think uh, nowadays, on our day to day basis, we get to work a lot on how uh, whatever we are doing builds towards development. And uh, a good way to do that is really working uh, using the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And um, in as much as we have an SDG that's focused on gender equality, which is SDG 5, actually gender intersects into all these other SDGs. So there's a way in which uh, gender affects uh, things to do with education, things to do with healthcare. Um, and um, then how does mapping and uh, data come in? Uh, one thing that came with the SDGs or one thing that we have seen in the past few years is how different institutions and individuals can use data to help progress development. So uh, using data to inform decisions or to actually act as evidence for uh, challenges that we are facing to show that this is actually happening here. So not just saying that uh, we, need, um, we need more schools, but uh, we, don't ha we don't have an idea of what's the population here, how many children are here, uh, what distances are people walking to schools. Uh, I think Janet also shared such a map that had been produced. So data helps us to do that. And location data also comes in to help us with explaining that. And uh, uh, if you're not familiar what gender data is, it's actually just data, but actually disaggregating that uh, by gender and sex. So a good, a good example is looking, for example, at COVID-19 cases and breaking that down into how many of these cases are, are males, how many are females. Uh, if we look at other cases like um, cancer, uh, we can also maybe break it down into the types and uh, be able to see which ones affect uh, which gender more and try to find any reasons. And that's how gender data could could be helpful just being able to see how challenges are affecting different groups and if uh, there's a group uh, where something is more prevalent and if there are solutions that you can actually create to respond to these groups. And that means being able to cater to everyone. Uh, the second definition is also just data that shows um, gender issues that, do, that actually do exist. So looking at the number of, say, gender-based violence cases, looking at the number of 
uh, female genital mutilation over the years and how that's trending. Is it reducing, is it increasing and what, and using that data to see how, uh, what can we do to make things better or to reduce these numbers. Um, and then uh, lastly is also that this is also data that is developed uh, through collection methods that are taking into account uh, social and cultural factors and how we can actually also use this data to reduce bias. Uh, I believe this year's theme is uh, break the bias. So how, how are we actually reducing it and what, what is data uh, telling and informing us that we can use to actually reduce bias against women? I think something that was trending today was uh, a Twitter bot in the UK that's showing uh, the gender pay gap uh, for different organizations that are tweeting using the hashtag IWD uh, hashtag on Twitter. And that is something that uh, we can see is as a result of uh, having gen gender data available, having data that's disaggregated by gender and sex. And uh, in as much as it sounds like a new concept, it actually isn't. Uh, this is something that has been there for a while, uh, although it, there was not a heavy push for it. So there is some data that is available uh, that we can group as gender data, but it's still not sufficient. Uh, very few African countries have uh, data disaggregated by gender. Uh, it's actually only just 15 countries uh, where like national databases and governments have been able to share data that, that has been disaggregated. And also if you look at other regions uh, like Latin America and Asian countries, we're only having a total of 10 countries with this kind of data. So, uh, um, and this is just data in general. So when you break it down even into open geospatial data, it's even a bit worse. And um, especially uh, in our case, in the geospatial space, uh, still looking at what what's available by organizations and different, different institutions, and also what's available on open data portals. Uh, you might actually find nothing for a lot of areas. Uh, and when it comes to open mapping platforms like OpenStreetMap that allow for crowdsourcing, then uh, in as much there is minimal data, there's room for actually people actively participating to generate this data. And now I'll uh, just go through a quick example on how gender data can intersect with an SDG. So when you're looking at uh, the SDG on healthcare, so, and if we look at uh, the targets and indicators, uh, actually six out of nine, out of the nine targets that are available are focused on women and girls, which just uh, highlights why it is important to actually look at how uh, gender intersects with everything. Because if, uh, we do generalize on how we are solving problems. Say so looking at healthcare as a general sector, and you're not really looking at female, female, uh, women and girls, then uh, we might not end up achieving any kind of development just because you're not catering to a huge group and what you're also measuring uh, won't be achieved. So uh, when you're looking at things like maternal healthcare and child mortality, sexual and reproductive health uh, and access to quality healthcare. And a project that we did in 2020, um, thanks to uh, a micro grant that we had received from Hot SM, uh, we did some mapping and what we did is uh, that we actually, this, <laughs> is that we actually mapped health facilities uh, within the country and highlighting which uh, which of these facilities offer uh, uh, maternal health care services. And then uh, looking at how accessible those are. And just looking at that data, you could see uh, in areas like uh, Northern Kenya, there are almost no facilities, uh, Northern and Southern Kenya. And um, actually these are the places where there's still uh, a high prevalence of maternal death uh, and also uh, maternal related deaths in women and children. And uh, by having this data available, then that means uh, governments and institutions and even organizations working in the space can be able to use this and see uh, what can be done 
and I, I guess that's sort of like an impact of how gender data could be useful because if that's if we had not highlighted that as a function then um uh, then what <laughs> what would then people be using in in other cases other than this um so an exact uh, uh, using such products organizations can actually come in and see and see uh, how they can allocate their finances and all that. So say, for example, if we have a certain budget for healthcare, then uh, instead of probably building another big hospital offering general services, maybe improve uh, services for maternal healthcare um, in existing hospitals, or actually build smaller clinics that cater to this problem. And uh, so, yeah, what you can do is that when you have more gender data, we can actually highlight issues that affect women and girls. So in addition to just saying that, yes, we do face problem X and Y, uh, this is actually how it looks like. This is what the data shows. And using that, we are able to advocate for that. And also uh, by this data being used, then we are able to um, achieve progress, not just for women and girls, but uh, global progress in general. So um, things that we can do is that we can uh, start looking at how uh, gender intersects with all these uh, development uh, goals that we have. So in education, how does it, does this look like? In urban planning, how does this look like? And how can we do that in open maps? Uh, I think something that has been done in other regions is like mapping uh, streets and mapping streets that actually have street lights and uh, comparing that with that, um, safety and security in that area and also gender-based uh, violence in that area. Um, so yeah, it's just looking into that and seeing what we can do when it comes to open maps and also in the open street map space. Another thing that's really lacking also uh, is the, uh, the lack of uh, enough tags to use uh, to map this, this issue. For example, when you're mapping the, doing the health, um, we're mapping the health facilities and trying to highlight a lot of uh, maternal health care services or female best health care services. There are a lot of missing tags to be able to do that, uh, meaning there's also a lot of work that needs to be done to push for those tags to be approved uh, by the Data Working Group and the OSMF Foundation and so that you're also able to add these things. And lastly, and I think <laughs> which is also usually mostly recommended is in our activities, also just trying to make sure that uh, there's, um, there's a good gender balance in terms of participants. So if you are having a mapping project, how does your uh, group look like? Uh, is it 50-50? Uh, and that just brings in uh, a, diverse, a diverse view of opinions and suggestions and how decisions are made and what you can do. Because most likely when we, to have, when you do not have female voices in the room, you tend to miss a number of things. Uh, same applies to the other way. Uh, if we only have female voices and lack male voices, then we're able to uh, at times miss a number of things. So yeah, the easiest way and uh, to start out in terms of improving equality is actually just making sure in our projects we have good participation from both uh, both ends. And I guess that's it. So. And I think uh, I'll stop there uh, and uh, to see how this conversation continues regarding gender data in OpenStreetMap and how we can improve that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura. And if anyone has any questions, um, please um, feel free to ask them. Um, Laura, I. I, I don't know if you could, would you be able to um, share your screen and um, just sh sh talk people through getting started with mapping if, um, because I think there are a few people here who are new. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And if anyone has any mapping questions or more general questions, please do ask them. So we'll just do a quick um, intro to mapping with this project. Um, and if you haven't already got an OpenStreetMap account, that will be the first step. 
also the the instructions for getting um started with mapping are also in the slack channel so if you haven't joined that um it would be a now would be a good time to do that as well Okay, uh, okay uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll just start uh, by showing. So for you to start contributing to, to the project, I believe Janet had shared um, a link to the project. You first need to have an OpenStreetMap account. So you would need to go to uh, openstreetmap.org um and then um I, i'm automatically logged in because i already have an account but yeah if if you are totally new uh if you go to this link you can also share it on chat Yeah, if you go to this link, you'll be able to access what is usually called the OpenStreetMap website. Uh, and on your top right, you'll see an option to log in or sign up. So uh, signing up is like creating any other um, account on a digital platform. So you would just need an email address and then set up a username, which we have here as the display name, and set up a password. Alternatively, you can also use an existing account like a Google or Facebook account to create an account uh, if you prefer it that way. So you'd only need to select and then uh, that would be it, and set up a password. So yeah, but the easiest way is to use your, your email address and then set up a username and password. Uh, username can be anything really. Uh, yeah, and you, you're also able to change it later. So uh, once you once you go through these steps and you sign up, uh, you should receive an, e um, an email on the email address that you provided and you will need to open that and confirm your account before you're able to do anything. So yeah, that's, that's the process of creating an account. And yeah, uh, once you confirm it, you should be able to log in with, with your details. Um, yeah, so uh, actually, when you once you've created the account, you are able to start contributing. You you can contribute directly to the map, although uh, it is not advised to do it that way uh, because of data quality issues, especially when you're mapping uh, areas where there are already other existing projects, or also things like urban areas where we tend to have a lot of mapping projects focused on that. Uh, so uh, it is advisable to contribute through uh, a created project, which is something uh, similar to what Janet has shared. So uh, if you go and chat, there's a link that had been shared that you can already open, so you can click on it. So, um, and basically the project is hosted within a tasking manager, which basically just allows us to uh, divide an area that you want to map into small tasks, uh, which allows for sort of sustainable contribution because uh, a style that I'm uh, working on is not something that someone else is working on. Um, yeah, so and another thing that you'll have to do, I think, is to sign in as well uh, within the tasking manager. So I guess we can also just go through that. So I don't know if there's anyone who was creating an account, uh, if they have encountered any difficulties. Um, yeah, but it should be pretty much straightforward. But if you have any difficulties while creating an account, of course, just feel free to post on chat. So yeah, when you come to the testing manager, you would also need to fast sign up uh, before you start contribution. But not to worry, <laughs> this is the only time you, you'll be signing up uh, across uh, the OpenStreetMap website and also the uh, the tasking manager. So yeah, also on this end, you'll also just need to share a name uh, and an email address. Let's just try and <laughs> do it together. Uh, and then you would you would need to link your existing OpenStreetMap account. 
account. So once you get here, you can click on I already have an OpenStreetMap account. And then it would prompt you to grant access and that would be it. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> as also just a few weeks, but uh, uh, account creation has been done, then you would just log in uh, to the testing manager. Yeah, so going back to the to the project link. Yeah, so yeah, for any project, most likely you would find a project set up within a tasking manager. Most likely it would be the hot tasking manager, which has been created and developed by the uh, humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. But there are also other instances of the tasking manager which are pretty much similar. And uh, I believe they have also been developed based on uh, this, this exact instance. Yeah, but once you go to a project, uh, what you see first is uh, on your left, you'd see um, an overview of the project. So you would see uh, the title, you also have a project maybe that you can use to search um, within the tasking manager. Maybe if you're coming back or if it's your person contributing to that project, uh, then you'd also see uh, um, basically an overview of the project. Uh, for example, in this case, you could see it's a summary on the work that crowd to map does um, on ending child marriage and gender-based violence. And that NGOs actually need better road and transportation area data. And that's what uh, the mapping is focused on. So it's generating this data for that. Then you will also see uh, the kind of features that we are mapping within the, for the project. So uh, when you're contributing to OpenStreetMap projects, you usually have room to map a number of features. So it's a uh, time building. Most of the times it's building, uh, at times it's buildings and roads. At times it's only roads. <laughs> I've also seen projects that where people are mapping land uses. So yeah, but most of the time it's buildings and roads or either of those. Um, but it's important to see what kinds of features are being mapped in that project and then actually just focus on that. Uh, then it also shows the kind of satellite imagery that we'll be using, which we'll explain more in a bit. Um, then you also see a longer uh, project description and the organization that um, is coordinating that project. Then lastly, you would see contributors for that project and the timeline for the same. Then on your right, you would see a map, which basically has broken down the area that we are mapping into tiny tasks. And, um, and basically, I can also see a number of things, uh, different colors for different tiles, for different tasks, and also some tasks seem, seem to be locked. Uh, then lastly, uh, at the bottom, you'll see a chance to contribute. So we'll explain more on the tasks that they mean in a few. So you need to click on contribute. Uh, if you're not logged in, uh, you'll be prompted to log in at this point. Also, if you don't have an account, I guess, yeah. Basically, you have to be logged in uh, for you to be able to access the contribute page. So yeah, in case you're not able to see that or you're not able to access this page, then just a signing in issue. Yeah, so once you get into, once you click on contribute, then you get more, uh, I'd say, technical instructions. Uh, and then you'd also see uh, more information or not this color zooming. So uh, the tasks have just been, uh, they've been color coded to explain the status of each. So uh, the ones that are clear are available to mapping, meaning you can select uh, them and start mapping. Then those that are uh, in light blue have already been mapped and uh, they are available for more advanced users to review the mapping that has been done and validate them as being correctly mapped or not being correctly mapped. And then uh, the ones that are, that are in green are actually those that have, that have been validated uh, and are found to have been correctly mapped. And then uh, at times you, you'll find tasks that are shaded in pink and those that just insist that 
uh, those are priority areas, but the people who created the project would prefer you start with those tasks um, as opposed to others. So a good example in this case is maybe if you're mapping areas that have been affected by a disaster, then uh, you would mostly find priority areas where data is needed urgently. Then lastly, the, the tasks that have been locked will appear to have like a, like a lock on them. And these are tasks that are currently being mapped by other mappers. Um, and so you cannot select those to map, which then means when someone is working on a tile, then uh, you can't select that. Uh, maintain, so it sort of that then maintains that data quality that we were mentioning earlier. So uh, avoiding that uh, process of someone is mapping uh, or people to form in the same area, uh, which might mean having uh, sort of duplicating data and also maybe deleting and all, all these issues. <laughs> then, yeah, but what's uh, important you also need to do is you need to read the instructions um, and see what's needed. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, you can see we've been asked to use uh, Macra imagery, which we'll see in the next step. Then we've been asked to trace buildings from satellite images. And then um, for local mappers, so if we are working on a project in an area that you're familiar with, uh, uh, you can click on the link. I can see it's a, it's a link and see. The, the basically added more information on uh, on tags and what you can add. Yeah, but if you are uh, you're a remote mapper, so you're not familiar with the area that's being mapped, it's then recommended to just uh, use the general tags that are available that we'll also see in a bit. Then um, in this case, there, there also, Crowd map has also shared a number of links, uh, which are basically tutorials on how you can learn to map. Uh, or it's not just for uh, beginners, but also for those uh, who need a refresher on how to map and how to contribute. Then lastly, one thing that they're mentioning is that if you open a task and you find that it's too huge, uh, there's usually a chance to, to split a task which will also show. We'll, we'll also show in the next step. So um, yeah, so basically, yeah, it's very important to go through the instructions just to have an overview of what's needed. So in this case, what's important is that we are using Maxa imagery. We need to map buildings. Um, and then uh, what else is that we need to accu uh, accurately outline all the buildings and then make sure we square them. And lastly, because we are mapping a rural area um, in Tanzania, we tend to also find hats, which are usually round, rounded as, of, as, as opposed to square, being square. So uh, they've also added a video on how to draw or to trace hats within the OpenStreetMap platform. So last step is that now you need to select a task and start mapping. So, I don't know if there are any questions. Ah, okay. Um, well, uh, the last thing is to select a task and start mapping. So there are usually a number of options. So down below, you can see there's an option to choose an editor. Uh, for beginners, we will use the ID editor, which is web-based, uh, meaning you don't have to install anything to, to be able to work on this project. But you also see there's an option to use JOSAM, uh, which is desktop based, you'll need to uh, install it, uh, then connect it with your OpenStreetMap account, and then use it. Uh, it is advised to use this when you are an intermediate mapper or uh, an intermediate or advanced mapper, or also for beginners, beginner mappers, and once you have some experience uh, with the platform and editing and how it works. Uh, but for now, we can go ahead and use the ID editor because it's um, a bit easier to use um, and also you won't need to install anything for now. Although, um, yeah, also you can always explore JOSAM. It also has, uh, uh, I'd say, <laughs> more capabilities in terms of what can be done and, and or how you can edit an OpenStreetMap. Uh, a good example is being able to make edits offline 
and submit those letter and also a bunch of other tools that allow for faster mapping. Then lastly, we also have an option here for the rapid editor, which uh, we won't go through, but it's based on the ID editor that allows for using Map with AI data um, that's been added by Facebook and Microsoft. Yeah, so automatically, I believe it selects the ID editor, but I think it also be, it depends on how the project is set up. But in our case, I think it automatically selects the ID editor. So uh, what you need to do, First, you can select a task that you wish to work on, but also if you click on map a task, it will auto select a random task for you. So um, whichever whichever you prefer. Um, yeah, so I'll just click on map a task. Uh, so I select a random task for us. For us, <laughs> then uh, a new page will load. Um, okay. Yeah, and oops. I think I refreshed it, so just a minute. Uh, yeah, a new page will be loaded, which basically loads the ID editor, uh, which is basically uh, uh, okay. which it's basically a web page uh, that will now allow us to make the edit. Um, something uh, something that we'll notice is that there are a number of tools uh, at the top and uh, on your right. So at the top, you will see the, the tools to add a point, to, to add a line, to add an area. And these are basically the tools that we use to add our features. So uh, points for adding any features that we have. So when it comes to things like points of interest, uh, we can use the points tool. Then we also have the line uh, tool that allows us to add linear features. So things like roads, rivers, yeah, anything that's basically a line. Then the area tool allows us to add um, polygon-like features. Then uh, on your right, you'll also see a number of tools. So uh, an option to zoom in and zoom out. And then um, we'll skip this, which is an option for, for the map to move to your location. Uh, so, but this is only useful, say for example, when you are trying to edit directly on the OpenStreetMap website, and maybe you would like to edit uh, your home area or somewhere that you're familiar with, uh, and you'd like it to auto detect your location so that you can make those edits. Uh, in this case, because you're working on a remote project for an area that you're not in, and also the project is focusing on this area, uh, we should not use this, uh, the show my location tool because it should basically zoom to that area. Um, and then, uh, but also talking about that, you can also see there's a, on the main screen, there's a, a purple sort of boundary box. And this is basically the task that has been selected for us, meaning we are only supposed to make edits within this boundaries and not outside. Then, uh, Last thing that's necessary is uh, also the imagery option. So uh, we, how we are adding data on of the street map is that we are basically tracing features based on uh, satellite imagery. And there are a number of providers that are available, but for each product, there's usually a recommendation that has been set to use. For example, in this case, uh, it's been recommended that we use uh, Maxa premium imagery or Max in general, I believe the standard option was removed uh, recently. So yeah, uh, basically it's recommended that you use what the person who set up the project has advised to use. Uh, because uh, when selecting an imagery choice, it depends on a number of things on how recent the imagery was captured and also in terms of the project is working on and yeah. so. Uh, if if Maxa imagery is not automatically loaded, uh, just make sure to click on this uh, button here, uh, which is like a layers button, and then select Maxa premium imagery, which you would notice the imagery change. For example, in my case, when it was auto loaded, what we had was this first option, uh, which is being the being imagery. Then I was able to change to this. 
uh, while we are here, there are also uh, a number of things that you will see. Uh, uh, something that you can do is when we start mapping at times, uh, uh, things might not be clear, the imagery might not be clear. The, so there are usually options to edit that image. So for example, you can increase the brightness, reduce it, uh, increase the contrast. So basically, you would set this to what will be able to help you to better identify the features. Then um, lastly is that we also have an option to offset, uh, uh, to do an imagery offset. So in some cases, you would find areas have already been mapped. So for example, this task that I have selected, you can see that there are a number of features. So this uh, things that, that look like pink, pinkish uh, boxes are actually buildings that have already been digitized in, in this area. So at times you will open a project, uh, select the imagery, but then you'll notice maybe what has been mapped uh, is not in line. So maybe uh, you'd find maybe these features are somewhere here, which basically looks like the features have been correctly mapped, but there's a misalignment to the imagery, so you would do an offset. But in this case, that's not the case. So you'd basically not do an offset. But yeah, maybe for different projects, if you encounter that, uh, that's what this imagery offset option is for. Yeah, then last thing, okay, not last thing. Uh, last but not least is, uh, there's also an option to turn on and off data that you want available on the map, which I don't think we have to do in this case since we are mapping a rural area. But uh, in some cases, when you're mapping urban areas and you are trying to do some mapping and there are lots of things mapped, uh, you can usually turn off a number of things so that uh, it's not uh, sort of distracting what you're able to see. Because uh, if maybe you're mapping, um, what they say you're mapping uh, roads uh, and buildings, but land uses have been mapped and uh, there are boundaries and there are all those things which can obstruct your view, you can usually turn them on and off here. Yeah. Let me click on uh, map features. Then there's also usually one last thing, uh, which can also support your mapping, which I also don't think is useful here. But uh, in case you're mapping an area that has street level imagery available, you can usually turn those on here, especially on mapillary. It's what we have available in a lot of countries. Um, then you can have a street level view that can allow you to maybe label buildings, add points of interest and such things. Um, yeah, last thing is the next button here, which usually shows errors. So as you're mapping a time, especially when you're starting out, uh, we, we might end up uh, introducing one or two errors. Uh, however, as you're mapping those errors, as you're mapping a project, uh, your errors will be highlighted here if you have any. So, um, and also at the bottom, you would see a red button. Uh, or yellow, so it's usually either an error or a warning. Um, yeah, so basically once that's shown, you can always click on that to rectify uh, them before submitting. Then, okay, last option here is our, uh, basically like tutorials or uh, help, help that you can use to, if you need a refresher, if you're starting out and you've forgotten how to do something, uh, just click on this button and then you can uh, go through it. You can go through the whole thing or if you uh, just want to learn more on how to uh, digitize something, so how to add, how to add polygons, then you would click on areas, how to add uh, things like roads, you'd click on lines. Uh, if you want information on uh, satellite imagery, you'd click on background imagery um, and all that. So there's always help there if, in case you've forgotten something and it's just like a quick resource. Uh, there's also usually a walkthrough option, which basically will give you like a testing environment uh, that will allow you to play around and do some contributions, 
and all that. So you can always also check the walkthrough uh, before you start contributing to a project if you wish to. Then uh, last thing to mention is also that uh, on your right here, you would see options to uh, close a task. Uh, also, if you, you can, if you need to review the instructions again on what to use uh, or to access on any of the links, just click on instructions here and you will be able to access uh, project instructions that have been added. So yeah, yeah, in case you did something at the start and then you need to review it again, you don't have to go back to the, to the project page to read the instructions. You can easily access them here. And yeah, that's that. So once you get here, uh, then um, you just need to start contributing. So uh, as you've seen for the project, we are only required to add uh, building for the project. And we've already set up the imagery, like we've selected the correct one, which also you can, we can always usually see that here at the bottom, uh, just as a, cross, as a way to cross check. So to start contributing, you basically need to zoom in to an area. And basically we are visually looking for features to add. And um, so you would need to zoom in as as much as as much as possible, uh, so that you cannot miss anything. Especially in uh, in rural areas, we tend to a lot of buildings tends to tend to be hidden. So you really you really need to be zoomed in to be able to access them to to be able to see them. It's not uh, similar to urban areas where. Um, at even uh, lower zoom levels, you're able to see all, all that has been mapped. And, um, and also an easy way to, to, to look at areas, especially in rural areas, is looking at where sort of several roads are converging to. So say in this case, like you could see uh, several roads in here and then and then you can also see even some of the features have, have already been mapped. So I will just show a quick example on how to add a building, because I've seen one here. So um, you can see here, like these two buildings have been mapped. So, but this is a building here that hasn't been mapped. So um, you would, uh, to, add, to add a building, you'd click on area the area tool at the top. And then uh, you would uh, select on the first corner, then the second one, then the third one, the fourth one. So on the fourth one, you need to double click on it. And then last thing that you need to do is to tag the feature that you have mapped. Um, and that is very important because even you can see before tagging, you'll see that you have a warning uh, at the bottom. So once you're done, Tracing that building, uh, you need to add the tag that that is a building. So you're basically just seeing the polygon that you have added is a building. And then the last thing that you need to do is to square that building. So to square it, you either right click it and um, select the square option. Then you'll notice it's squared, uh, but it's also you can also just press Q on your keyboard. Uh, and that building is squared. So that's how you add a building. So, and for every edit you'll make, you'll notice um, the number of, there's, there's a number that shows up here, which basically shows the number of edits that you've made. So it's not always uh, that this represents the number of buildings that you've added, but it's actually the number of edits. So if you delete a feature, this number will also increase. If you modify a feature, this number will also change. Uh, yeah, so basically you hover around uh, your area and look for more features to map. And that's how to make edits <laughs> on OpenStreetMap, as simple as that. Um, yeah, so I don't know after that point if there's someone who's been following through and they have a question on contribution, maybe you had a challenge when you're creating your account. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, Laura. Any, any questions, anyone? How's everybody getting on with mapping? Okay, well, um, while we're um, continuing to map, we'll hear from our last speaker, um, Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel, can you unmute yourself and I'll share your slides from here. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Okay, um, let me see if I can share them this time. <laughs> right, can everybody see these slides? Yeah. Yeah, yes. okay, great, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Hi, everyone, I'm Ezekiel Kasanga, uh, the director of Tumain School, uh, found in Tabora, Tanzania. And I'm here actually to talk a bit about the, the way mapping actually is helping us to support teen mothers to access to education. And as we are talking about uh, mapping, I would like to say that most of our uh, teen mothers uh, actually are coming from rural areas and mostly from the interior where the transport network, uh, especially the roads are poor, and even the mobile network are weak, and in some places are not available at all. Uh, so with that, it's like um, mapping now become very important because it helps us to have a list of locations of all villages and hamlets where teen mothers uh, live. And again, it helped us to understand the entire catchment area. Here, I mean the coverage uh, of our two mine school, and also uh, even to understand and determine the distance from the two mine school uh, to the homes of those teen mothers. And with that, it's like it helped us to 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 see how we can help them maybe with the with the with the transport. And uh, apart from that. Also, uh, mapping is helping us actually to understand why the, the dropout of, of the girls happen. You know, for instance, with the walking distance, uh, with mapping, we know uh, the walking distance from the homes of, of, of the girls to the schools they are attending. And as we know, uh, the walking distance is one of the factors which is put in this uh, young girls into a risky of becoming pregnant. And uh, again, it is the walking distance from the, the homes of the girls to uh, water sources and the other essential uh, uh, social services. Uh, for instance, we know for sure that most of the girls come into risky of, uh, or fall into the hands of bad people, especially those who are raping them uh, when they are, for instance, they are watching, uh, they are, they, they, they are uh, going to, to, to take waters for, for domestic uses to their homes or to uh, other social services, including uh, hospitals, you know. So with that, uh, we get now the, uh, uh, the knowledge or the understanding of the walking distance from homes to the uh, centers, for reasons of water sources and, and et cetera in relation to the risk uh, these girls are getting, uh, especially in falling into the hands of the, those people who are raping them. And again, uh, with mapping, is where now we come to know about the availability of health services. Because with mapping, we are able to map where the social services like the health services are found and the, 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 the village and the hamlets so with that, it's like we are in a position of understanding, for instance, one, uh, the number of households that are saved by one health center, let's say a dispensary or uh, a healthy uh, center. And with that, it is even possible to determine uh, the availability of, let's say, um, uh, this we call uh, sexual and reproductive health services, especially to, to 
to these uh, young young girls. And uh, in short, I can say with mapping, now we know uh, the causes and also we know how to help these young mothers. And even for planning, planning on how we can uh, visit them, planning about the transport, uh, planning about the, 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 the support we can give them in terms of accessing our school, uh, because uh, our school basically is providing second chance to teen mothers, the ones who become uh, pregnant and uh, with one reason or another, they fail to get back to the former schools, the schools they were attending before uh, becoming pregnant. So in short, that is uh, what uh, mapping is doing for our to buy in an uh, open school here in Tabora, Tanzania. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ezekiel. And if anyone has any questions for Ezekiel, please either unmute yourself or um, ask them in the chat. And there is also a link to his website in the chat too. And any mapping questions, please feel free to ask. Um, if not, Harry, would you like to say a little bit about your um, mapping project in um, Magumu? Um, in, for the your um, micro grant? Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe I can say a little bit about the mapping that we're doing. Hi, everyone. And Happy uh, Women Day, everyone. Um, yeah, so so far we are doing great with the project. We have the micro grant of mapping head center facility in Gumsorengeti, mapping 30 villages uh, due to the challenge that many uh, community members in their village do not have an access of head center facilities uh, like uh, hospitals, um, clinic, uh, farmers and dispensary so they uh, travel a very long distance to have the access of all those stuff so uh, my project was to try to uh, uh, accumulate or conducting the information about all those uh, health center facilities and their availability and their operation status so i've included um, some of the youth map by in Bunsorengeti. i've included some of um, community member in the co uh, in the community and some of the guests at the safe house and uh, other people so um and people are really uh, a community who are really interested in the health data so uh we've trained them on how they can use uh open data to do some data collections and you know doing some survey and doing some mapping so that um uh, Later on, we can try to add uh, the data we collected from the head site, uh, which is the information where we share the head site. So, so far now we have done uh, with uh, data collection and we are going to the next phase of, you know, cleaning the data and updating, uploading all the data into the head site and uh, sharing the information that we collected with uh, other organizations that are really interested in working with health and also um, local governments. And from there, we can start um, formulating the question and asking the, you know, the possibility of extending the health facility to all those villages and the community so that people can have the, you know, access of health center facility and can have the service when they are sick or when they need an assistance. So thank you very much. And thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Harry. And um, if anyone's got any questions, please um, ask them. And um, Nicole, Nicole, do you want to say anything about Trufi? Um, sure. Hi, I'm Nicole. Uh, 
Uh, I'm the volunteer coordinator of Trufi Association. Uh, we are an NGO that's based in Germany, uh, but we have volunteers from all over the world. And we make journey planners for people who live in communities that don't necessarily have formal transportation um, that has set routes or set stops or set times. And um, yeah, we're always looking for volunteers. We are primarily volunteer run. Um, so yeah, I can also drop my email in the chat if you wanna reach out. And yeah, happy Women's Day, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. And we're certainly um, hoping to do this, um, to do some bus routes, etc., in Tanzania. And I know Harry is working on this at the moment. Super. Yes, definitely. We need to, to get it moving. <laughs> yeah, because we are also entirely uh, volunteer run, it depends on the, the schedules of our volunteers when they're able to train. But yeah, definitely, I will be in touch very soon. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I see we've got um, Zamzam, one of our um, interns here. I don't know if you want to say anything about um, your internship, Zamzam. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Zamzam. I have been intern in Quarto Map through Ebrashi Map program and uh, it was very interesting. I have been learning a lot about geospatial and uh, how to represent mapping and how to help people on that data. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, we're really hoping that we can repeat the internship um, program again at some point. So um, if there's anybody else that wants to talk about their mapping project um, or ask any questions, please feel free. Otherwise, I think I'm gonna stop the recording now.